right, bet. If you can, um, go ahead and open up your cameras. That way I feel like I'm not talking to myself. And I guarantee you, the, typically people whose cameras is open, they engage a little bit more with the class. Um, so let's do this. Let's jump into conversation about what you guys discussed in your breakout room. Um, once we do that, I'll go into my notes for the reading and that will lead us into our fishbowl. So who wants to kind of talk about what was discussed while you guys are in your breakout room? We can go, go ahead, go ahead, Tana, Tana. Uh, In our breakout room, we discussed eleven, and I believe um, one of our one of our group members also said twenty two for the point. Okay. Um, I only have a summary of both of them, but for eleven, what I took from it was follow your heart cheerfully and don't give too much attention to reoccurring issues like problems that are always going to happen in life and then uh, a quote like i took a quote from that one it says wealth is no good if you're glum and that one just really spoke to me i think they also agreed because it's kind of like yeah everyone wants to have wealth but wealth does you no good if you're not a happy person yeah, it's a very good point yeah um, last class talked about that as well um, thank you. Anybody else want to speak to what they found of importance or what was discussed in their breakout groups? I can say something. Yeah, please. I was in the group with uh, Tanaya and I said the one of 22 and I really like what it's saying because it's what well, I think it's kind of saying like about not being selfish. It was 22. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's more about like, like giving also. But what I've noticed from all of these was kind of like the Ten Commandments. Well, that's what I feel like kind of related to that. But yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Thank you, Dulce. Let's get one more before we move on to my notes. Um, I mean, I was personally a big fan of number one. I think for me, a lot of the time, like, um, what I've learned is that at least like there's there's always somebody who's more knowledgeable on the subject there's always somebody who understands more uh, that knows more and for me like looking especially at number one it makes me kind of realize that you know like sometimes some of the smartest people aren't the people who know a lot but more so are the people who are willing to seek knowledge so Thank you, Jay. That's a very good point. And again, that's why I, I believe I mentioned last week, right? As intellectuals, we should be more concerned with asking good questions than having answers, right? And that kind of speaks to what Jaden is speaking to. Um, all right, so bad. let me do this. I'm going to go into my notes to help provide some context for the reading. And then once I've gotten through that, we'll have our first fishbowl of the semester. Um, so as mentioned, this book is literally called uh, The Teachings of Patahotep the oldest book in the world. And in the preface, they qualify and validate that claim. Um, one thing, if you guys are reading a text, do not, do not, do not start with the first chapter. Read the preface, read the forward, read the introduction. There's a lot of important information in those, pi um, those parts of the book that help you understand the text a little bit more, okay? Um, so some things that I was able to pull from the preface. Um, Patahotep, he was 110 years old when he was writing this book. Um, at the time, he was in line to become the pharaoh, but he neglected the throne and opted to go into the priesthood, right? So one thing that this connotates for me is in all comedic mystery schools or in their educational system, they were producing two pathways. One, to go into politics, right? To sit on the throne as Pharaoh. Two, to go the more spiritual route, right? To be a priest, a sage, a prophet, things of that nature. Patahotep opted to go with the spiritual route opposed to the political route, okay? Um, Medu Netur, right? Medu Netur, M-D-W, N as in Nancy, E-T-C-H-E-R. Metter Netur is Africa and the world's oldest recording writing system. Here's what's important. There is no evidence of a development stage for the Metter Netur. Now what the Metter Netur is, is the original word 
for what we call the hieroglyphics, right? So when the Greeks, the Romans, the Hyksops, the um, invaders came into Kemet and they seen the artwork in, um, etched into the pyramid walls, they called it the hieroglyphics. The Kemetics themselves called it the metronitur. And again, this is the world's oldest writing system, okay? And there's no evidence, there's no record of a developmental period. So once um, investigators discovered this language, this written tradition, it was already in full development, okay? Not only Africa's oldest, but the world's oldest written system. Um, here's, I'm gonna read a quick passage that details the, um, how old this text is. Uh, the instructions of Batahotep were copied during the Middle Kingdom on papyri that are still preserved, right? So they were able to, provide, to preserve the paper that this is written on. Some Egyptologists believe that because the instructions were attributed to Patahotep and because there were indeed an old kingdom sage, sage is just somebody who's into spiritual practices, right? Old kingdom sage by that name and because Middle Kingdom writers attributed the sayings to that sage who was said to have served under King Asa of the fifth dynasty. Therefore, they should accept that attribution in the absence of compelling evidence to the contrary, right? So they're saying just that alone is enough evidence to believe, right? Even if it were in the Middle Kingdom material at the age at the age of, his, of the 12th dynasty, approximately 2000 years BC, it would still be the oldest wisdom literature in the world, okay? Given a fifth dynastic, dynastic age, we can say that the instructions of Patahotep belong to a period approximately 2,500 years before Christ, right? So a lot of you who are saying this kind of reminds them of the Bible, um, you're right. But keep in mind that this predates the Bible, not, not even the Bible, excuse me, this predates Christ 2,500 years. Um, Metronetur, that is spelled um, M-D-W, Mary David Wilson, M-D-W, N as in Nancy, E as in Edward, T as in Tom, C as in Cat, H as in Harry, E as in Edward, R as in Roger. Metur Netur, that's how you spell that. Okay, so we know that this text is that it can be traced back at least 2,500 years prior to, prior to the birth of Christ, okay? Now, what Patahotep did, he developed what is called the Metur Nefer, right? So M-D-W, N as in Nancy, F as in Frank, R as in Roger. Medu Nefer. And what the Medu Nefer is, is good speech, right? So this book is all about having good speech, right? Engaging in linguistics, engaging in conversation that build up, pour life into, and affirm people opposed to tearing individuals down, right? So when we think about this course being a course of the African oral tradition, right? We must understand that this notion of the African oral tradition is, in fact, the metu nefer, good speech, speaking positive into people, right? Um, I know they like to call profanity curse words, right? I don't view it that way, but I do understand the impetus of using words to curse somebody, right? To call forth negative on their person or their being or their well-being, right? It's the same principle. The Kamex understood this, right? So what Patahotep wanted to do is to ensure that we have an organized society based on this notion of metu nefer, speaking well to one another, right? And this bleeds into this notion of relations, right? And when we get into week six, we'll read the text by Edward Glissant, the poetics of relation that deals specifically with this idea but think about relations as the root word to relationship, right? How do we interact with one another? How do we talk to one another? How do we treat one another? How do we view one another? This is a fundamental concern with the comedic societies, how they relate to one another.
right? This idea in this uh, video that we watched last week of building heaven on earth. Patahotep sought to do that through this book, right? We're going to create heaven on earth by the way that we relate to one another. And this becomes important. So those are my notes. Um, we will move into our fishbowl. With your fishbowl, you could talk about what we discussed in the breakout rooms. We could talk about something that was brought up through my notes that I just gave right now. You can literally read your journal entry. That's perfectly fine as well. As long as you say something that pertains to the reading, you did what you need to do for your fishbowl. Um, everyone has to go at least twice. You have one time to pass. Um, does anybody want to volunteer to fishbowl? Okay, Grisella, I got you. Uh, I got, okay, thank you. Um, Tiana, tonight I got you as well. Thank you. Um, two more. Does anybody else want to volunteer? If not, I'll just call on people at random. Me too. Okay, Brianna, thank you. And we have one more slot. I want to volunteer, but um, can I, I don't, I'm not sure where we're reading from. Um, did you read the Patahotep reading? The teacher of the Patahotep? Um, was that the one that you sent in the uh, Outlook email? Yes. I think is it. I got how long to open it back up. And um, so again, if not, if you did your journal, you could pull from your journal. Um, you could talk about what was discussed in your breakout rooms, or you could even use what I just said right now in my brief um, notes. So all that's on the table. You want to give it a go? You want to try it? I'll just, I'll just, why not? Let's go okay. ahead. I'm going to just see if I can do so, that. Griselda, Tanaya, Brianna, and Kine. How do you pronounce your first name again, man? I'm it's Kine, but I'll typically yeah. go by Mac. Okay. Um, yeah. Mac. So it's you four. Again, just say something as it pertains to the reading. It could be from your journal. It could be from um, your conversation in the breakout rooms or from my notes. Everything is on the table. Um, whoever wants to start, it's on you. So whoever wants to start, okay. on, no. yeah, go ahead. I'll start. So from the reading, actually, um, it I was presented with a couple questions like that just immediately came to mind. Uh, one of them were, since there are similarities among these points and the Bible, why are, why are they failed to be included in the work of God? Are these not encounters of God by his people? And when I was reading, that's the only thing that really came to my mind. Um, I think Duce had mentioned it earlier, how it reminded her of the Ten Commandments, and like specifically, like point eighteen. It, from what I got from it, it's don't pursue a taken woman. No love affair will work in your favor if you do so. And in the Bible, it tells you do not lust after your neighbor. So I, when making those connections. And I think of present day, it, it makes me question, why aren't we also taught these things that those are also God's people? God's people weren't just the people written around the time of the Bible. God's people have known about God for years before the coming of Christ. So I just, I don't know. That's one thing that really just stuck with me throughout reading. Um, what I, I do want to point out before we move forward, so um, a couple of things about what Tanaya just said as it pertains to your journal, right? One, when you talk about component three, your contemporary analysis, this book was written in, um, it says 2,388 BC through roughly 2,356 BC, right? It's a rough time period. But what she was able to do was take a text written in that time and apply it to what's going on now. Right. So that is a quintessential depiction of what I call a contemporary analysis, taking what you're reading from back in the day and applying it to what's going on now. Right. Second point, she asked the question, the fourth component of your journal, your questions. But the question is not just is not simply because she does not understand something. Right. The question she asked has a, is a lot more fecund than just her not understanding. She says, well, how come this is not included into the Bible? Right. That question alone can produce a whole nother paper within itself, 
right? She could go along trying to answer that question and that could be a, a dissertation if she so choose. That could be a book if she so choose, right? So there's three ways to think about questions. One, I don't understand this, so I'm asking a question. Two, what Tanai is doing. Mm, something seems a little off. I have this question, but this question can lead to deeper research later in life, right? And the third way to ask a question is I don't necessarily agree with this, but I'm going to ask a question to critique what I'm hearing, right? And what Tanaya has demonstrated for us is the second way to ask a question, a question that could produce more research and more academic work. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Um, who's next? Uh, I'll follow it up. Okay. I'm looking at this line right here that I found really interesting. Um, he who hears is beloved of God. He whom God hates does not hear. So I found that line to be interesting, such as um, I've always had the notion like God and hate doesn't necessarily seem to be something that I would really um, like connect with each other because yes, God is described as love, father, and whatnot. And what so in this line, I feel almost contrasting that God has this vengeance and hate towards like certain individuals. So I've always felt that notion to be particularly, I guess, I, I would say arrogant in a way. Like I always felt like at certain points of describing God as, you know, if like in this context of us being the creation and describing God as angry or any emotion like that, it feels almost like backwards almost, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's just my thoughts on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, I want to circle back to that, Mac, but I'm going to do that once we get through the um, the fishbowl because you bring up a good point that I, I want to touch on. Um, sure. um, well, I would like to background on like what he said, what God used of, uh, use of um, hate because um, growing up in a Christian household, I was taught that God loves everyone, so it wouldn't make sense for God to hate us just for not being a hearer. And yeah, um, Relating to what I read on the book, teaching a person to speak posterity, like teaching someone to like believe in their beliefs, like pass it down through generation to generations. And that's what the book is primarily saying, like teach your son to be a hero, you know, follow through the expectation to, ha to have a good life, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Gisela, you you're the last one to round us out. Yeah, okay, so um, I put on my journal that um, the reading is like instructions given by Patahotep, how do you say it? Patahotep. Patahotep, okay. So it is um, ancient wisdom passed down from generations to generations. Um, a quote was, may he become a model for children of the great. So this wisdom was given to Pharaoh's sons and there were instructions and guidance, 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 sorry, um, that was meant for children, parents, and everyone. It is, so there's some points that I took in and I would use in my daily life. These pharaohs were leaders to their people and someone they looked up to and someone they can praise. And unlike today's society, like in North Korea, they're afraid of um, their leader and they have no choice to praise them, but in ancient time, it was their choice. And um, today's rulers are like evil and they don't have the same morals as I can tell by the pharaohs because they actually did care about their people. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good point talking about leadership also because in the text, right, they tell you how to be a leader, right? So if you are a leader of people, be pure in your ways, right? Like that's vastly out of contradiction with the people who lead our society. In fact, we're more comfortable with our leaders having scandal, right? Uh, being corrupt, right? Just being ratchet as hell. That's just normal for us in our society. It's foreign to think about a, a leader without any corruption or any skeletons in their closet, right? Um, for those who fishbowled, how was that process for you? How did you guys feel about that? I was kind of nervous, but it was fine. Yeah, it's fine. to get it off my chest. Yeah, it's not that big a deal, right? Anybody yeah. else want to comment on the fishbowl process? I like it, honestly. I like being able to say what I thought about something and then also seeing, you know, someone else's interpretation of that same text. So it's it's really interesting for me. 
Yeah. And, and another implicit um, intentionality of the fishbowl, it allows you guys to learn from one, from one another, right? So I'm sure there's something that Griselda said that you may have thought about or you did not think about that you found to be helpful, right? Um, this may have been something that Brianna said that you did not think about or you thought about and you found it to be helpful, right? So this allows for the transferring of knowledge not to only come from me, but to come from you guys. And it also allows me to learn from you guys as well. So I hope this kind of takes some of the angst off of having to do a fishbowl. It's really not that big of a deal. Um, to be real with you, Mac, I don't even know if you read this shit, but you did an effective fishbowl, right? Like you were able to put some things together to contribute to the fishbowl and you get your full participation points, right? So the way that the course is designed is for you to be successful in this process. You can literally read your journal. That's fine. You could talk about what was discussed in the breakout rooms. That's fine. You could take the notes that I give you right before the fishbowl and comment on something from there. And that's perfectly fine, right? So it's not designed for you to fail. It's really designed to set you guys up for, for success. Um, one thing I did want to circle back to, and bro, both Mac and Brianna mentioned this, this notion of a vengeful or hateful God, right? And both of you mentioned um, that's an unfamiliar concept to you. Um, Brianna said growing up in a Christian home, that is an unfamiliar concept to her. Um, I grew up in a Christian home as well. But if you pay close attention, that's not an unfamiliar concept. So if you don't accept the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what happens to you? Somebody let me know. Hell. You're going to hell right? That sounds vengeful to me. Um, for my people who read the Bible, who know the Bible, anybody familiar with the story of Job? Brianna, you familiar with the story of Job? How about I'm back? Go ahead, Matt. You can speak on that. Go ahead. Oh, on the book of Job. Oh, man. I, should, I'm a, I'm a, I should know, but I'm sorry. I don't. Okay. Um, so Job, right? Job was God's most trustful and faithful um, follower, right? Satan comes to God with a wager. Says, you know what, God? I bet you that I could get Job to curse you. God like oh, I do know this story. It's the one where God kept trying, kept throwing like things where it was like, um, it's, like killing his sons. Like, he lost his, like, his castle or something. He lost his, like his father. He lost his wife. He lost everything. He, he like, I think, um, I don't remember how the story was at the end, but like, I don't think he cursed God. Did he curse God? No, he never curses God. He, so, he, even with all his uh, ailments and afflictions and everything that God threw his way, like he still stood 10 tones down and was still on God's team for real. Yep. So think about this, right? For a wager, for a bet, Job had to go through losing his entire family, had to go through losing his home, his livestock, right? His ability to, to maintain and produce his wealth, right? Not because he did anything wrong, just to see how faithful he would remain. That shit sounds kind of vengeful, vengeful and sadistic to me. It, yes, I'm not gonna lie. I would be like, God, I have been your faithful follower. Why me? The fuck, like, God. The fuck. Why? And, and it was, was the craziest part was God didn't even bless him back. He was just down bad from that point. Even like, God just threw away a faithful servant for no reason. For bro. no reason. For a, for a bet. For, for a, a bet, bet with Satan, bro. Yeah. So I just I just bring these things up to say that we let's not get confused in this notion that we have never been presented this notion of God that's not vengeful or hateful. Right? True. That's true. Didn't he wipe out like all the first sons of Egypt at one point or something like something like that? Something crazy like that. Yeah. I'll be wilding. D depends on how he's depicted, right? Or she's yeah. depicted. Uh Jenny, you had your hand up? Go ahead. Uh yeah. I wanted to chime in on this too, because in some ways too, like um, not necessarily just in the Bible, but like the idea of like an vengeful God, um, it has very much so existed, not so much like, because like even through the founding of like America in general, I think um, a lot of Christian works kind of are inter um, interwined with the way um, we not only look at things like our constitution and older documents, but the way that we perceive like society and especially within like the early like or no like the late 1700s like early 18th century the really big um movement i think it was like the first um i forget the name puritan it was like a really big, 
yeah, the Puritans, and there was like this really big movement um, where it was like almost every, um, it's all slipping from my head, I'm sorry. But um, I wanted to bring up this one sermon uh, that was called um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by um, Jonathan Edwards. Mm -hmm. um, he made a really big point about the idea of you kind of hanging between the thread of hell from essentially God just kind of holding you up um, from the ashes. So I, I think like not only, I guess like in a Bible standpoint, but as well as like from what's considered to be an American standpoint or even just like from the way we look at um, or perceive any biblical work, like, like God is a loving person or is a loving being, but he's just as much, if not more vengeful, so. I was okay, to add on to that. My bad, like I know this rough or anything. Like uh, I would say, it, like it has to do with the depiction because um, it's all in the text. It's in the text. The, our impression of God, uh, in the, in the Christian sense, comes from the text of the Bible. So what we do know about God, that's you know written, comes from there. So our impression. So, like for me, I've always felt personally more like, as a creation, it's not necessarily my place to say or say or to, like describe how whatever created me feels it's like this is not when we saying god did this god did that god god hates you or even the element of hell and if you don't do this and you follow all the rules perfectly you'll go to hell and your god your creator is going to throw you into this burning pit so i've always whenever i do pray this this is my belief when i do pray i always give thanks to more or less this uh the, this like the, i'm not describing necessarily but more like the bigger picture, I guess you could say, in terms of like, I give thanks to my existence and the creation of the creator of my existence, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, tonight, you had your hand up and then um, there was somebody else with a hand up. Um, but go ahead, Tanaya, while I figure out who the other person was. Um, one thing that really like just circles my mind when I hear of the vengeance of the Lord, I just think of how there's a scripture that says, basically, do not seek vengeance. Vengeance is the Lord's. And when I further think about that, and then I also think about who who interpreted the Bible, who, you know, the original text of the Bible wasn't in English. So a lot of things can be lost in translation. And maybe the way that it was interpreted was interpreted in a way that his actions were more... How, how do I want to word it? Um, his actions were a lot stronger than they were originally depicted mm -hmm. from the original language. And our choice of words is maybe a lot stronger than how it actually was and how God actually impacted people's lives. And when I also think of the story, like from the Bible that you told us, it reminds me of present day, present day situations when people it just seems like dang like I can't catch a break sometimes I'm pretty sure everyone has a point in their life where they're like I just can't catch a break like there's just something hitting me back to back to back and when I further think about that thought itself I don't think to curse God I think this is the way of the world when the world became corrupt the ways of the world also followed with corruption that's why you see people who are good-hearted getting their hearts broken or people who do good getting bad done to them. I don't think it's necessarily, oh, God's out to get me. I think it's more so God not intervening with the ways of the world. And then when we see his grace, that's his intervention. I like that. Uh, David, you had your hand up and then Brianna. Uh, all right, so um, I went I went to uh, Catholic um, high school. So, um, I, my point of view of religion, I'm Catholic. I am very, I feel very strong towards God. You get me? Um, but my English, one of my English teachers did make a good point. If we're reading the Bible uh, from a literature standpoint, um, you know, putting our beliefs aside and everything and throughout the whole Bible, um, I, um, he made this point that what if the devil, what if Satan was the good guy? Because Satan never killed Satan never caused disruption so much. You get me? And mm -hmm. what did God do? He, he killed. He, um, you know, put people. He pushed people to the limits to the extent. 
And I'm looking at it from a literature standpoint. I'm not saying that, you know, um, yeah, I, I still, you know, strongly believe in God and everything, but it's just that he made a really good point. Like, um, why is are we just depicted like this? Because um, there's this man in power. Are we, do we just see the Bible like this because of power? You get me? Because God is so mighty and powerful. You get me? Mm-hmm. And I think so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. I'm sorry. Uh, so no, I was just. It was just that I find out. I found it somewhat interesting and curious because it was just like, well, I mean, he's not wrong. What has the devil ever killed? You know, in the Bible, like that. And um, not that I've, not that I know for sure, 100. percent But I just know, um, you know, God kid, killed yeah. thousands and thousands of people and floods and everything and natural disasters. So it's kind of like, you know, you kind of see it from a literature standpoint, like who's the one that actually did the bad things and the good things, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think it goes back to tonight's point of, of interpretation of who's giving you this depiction of God. Uh, Brianna? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know if this is, this is right, but for number 29 in the book, it talks about forgiveness, like it, for those who wronged us. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think that's kind of weird because of the concept of God forgiving us like if we go to if they're if we're forgiven we go to heaven if we're not forgiven we go to hell but this it talks about forgiving those who committed a misdeed so it doesn't really you know make sense to me um so let's read it and then we'll unpack so, That's a good point. if you're angered by a misdeed then lead toward a man on account of his righteousness the second part is what's important right so a wrong has been done to you but what he's suggesting is that you lean toward a man on account of his righteousness. So don't trip about the misdeed. Think about the righteousness that is within that individual, right? Period. Pass over the misdeed and don't remember it. Since God was silent to you on the first day of your misdeed. So when you first fucked up, right? God forgave that. He was silent. He did not, she did not chastise you for that mess up. So you should have the same type of grace on individuals who've done you wrong, right? And I think it's also, it's different that we, I'm sorry, it's important that we separate how we've understood the Bible to be and what this is, okay? This is written 2,500 years before the birth of Christ, right? So this predates the Bible. Right. So one can argue that the Bible is an interpretation of this. Right. Because this came first. So within these texts and within these pages, there's no mention of the concept of hell. When we read next week about Ma'at, there's no mention of hell. It's that either you successfully navigate the afterlife or you unsuccessfully navigate the afterlife. Right. Another thing to think about as we do a juxtaposition between the Bible and this text, what is the acronym for the Bible? The Bible is an acronym. What is the acronym for the Bible? Does anybody know? Basic instructions before leaving Earth, right? Yep. The basic wow. instructions before leaving Earth. Right? So think about what that means. This is how you should live while on Earth so that way you could successfully go to heaven, right? This is what they're saying. What Patahotep is concerned with, what the comedics are concerned with, is making heaven where? On earth, right? So these are basic instructions how to exist with one another while here on earth, right? We're, what they're concerned with is making sure that people interact with one another positively, not later, not in the afterlife, but here, right? This is what the concern of Patahotep is. This is why he asked his superior to write this text, right? To avoid strife, to avoid beef from popping up, right? This is what he's up to. Um, other thoughts, questions, or comments about the reading? Um, this doesn't directly kind of tie into the reading, but I am kind of curious about this. Okay. Um, so I do remember um, you mentioning earlier that, um, that this like book in general predates like the birth of Christ. So because of that, like for me, it's interesting because like given the fact that, I mean, this is a time of pharaohs, ancient Egypt, like I can't help but think like what, what, um, 
what time in history did this book exist in to like where pharaohs had an idea or could at least like kind of contemplate the idea of heaven like where do you get that concept from we'll we'll get a little bit more into that next week um but you're right right yeah and, and, and we're so it's so hard to conceive this because of where we're at as a society right we don't even allow for the practice of contemplation right like how many of y'all just spend an hour just to do the practice of thinking right not for school not for anything just to think for thinking sake who does that in this class i got you right is no one does that shit, right because we're not geared as a society to do that to place value on that right so we have to think about a time where there was no nine to five that you had to go through daily right where the primary concern of the society was being a spiritual being right existing in your fullness of your spiritual being living the highest capacity of who you could be right that's what, what the, the impetus, that was the focus of what the society was, far, so far from what we're accustomed to now. So you're right, Jaden, it's hard to wrap your mind around these two things. Um, Tanaya, you had your hand up? Um, honestly, what it like makes me think about with this writing and then the scriptures in the Bible and who wrote the Bible, the prophets within the Bible, it just makes me think like, I feel like a lot of people don't think about the fact that the Bible didn't just happen over the course of like 10 years like this is over the course of thousands of years so it's very possible like like even with the account encounters of Moses right what that is still around this same time period so to think like oh Moses's interpretation yes he is a prophet and he's telling you what is going to happen but to think that the same people in his time of living someone else didn't also get that same perception would be foolish to think he was the only man in the world at that time that interpreted God or that saw the world to, you know, what the world would come to when certain things would happen in the world. So I just think as people, we are so used to being small minded and taking things as they're given to us. We don't ever want to consider like, there is more the, to the picture. Clearly with God, there's more to the picture. There wouldn't be different religions if there wasn't more to the picture. We would all just conform right off the bat. That's why, you know, I don't know who I was talking to this about, but I was thinking like, in order to fully understand God as a creator, you would have to read and read to understand every religion. Not You can't just read the Bible. You would also have to read the Quran. You would also have to read the Torah just to get a bigger scope. And even then, you're going to have to read the scriptures that related to the land at that time. Context, context is important. I mean, then also, like, think about this. To understand God as a creator, especially as women, right? To me, and this is why I say there's nothing closer to God than women. I would say particularly the black woman because that's the original woman. But y'all create right? If you have a baby, what are you doing? That's the act of creation, right? And to think about all the love, the support, the nurturing that goes into that act will help put you to the mind state of God, right? Like to think about carrying something in your, in your womb for nine months, the level of care and appreciation and how meticulous you would be about their coming to age, right? If you're in the sound mind and body, right? To me, that puts you very close to understanding what it's like to be godlike, right? To be a creator. Because we all are creators. Um, Jaden? Yeah, no, that, that's also a very interesting point. Um, I think for me, like the way I'm thinking about it is because like, like the Bible itself is already like a complicated book in general. Like the fact that not only we have something like that that has existed through millennia essentially is already hard to wrap your mind around but i think the fact that like like to be able to be able to make a separate book and probably not know that something else like that exists to a degree like a separate book 
in general, like that is almost that is essentially the Bible. For me, like it's kind of it's kind of hard to wrap my head around the idea that um that someone else is kind of going around saying something that similar. So, so Jaden, let, 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 help me understand. When you're talking about the separate book, are you referring to the teachings of Patahotep? Yes. Okay, so this must be historically accurate and context is important. It's not that somebody wrote a separate book from the Bible. This is written before the Bible. So if we are to be historically accurate, we would have to say that somebody wrote a separate book from this, right? Because if this comes before 2,500 years before Jesus even walked the planet, and we know that the Bible was produced after Jesus' passing, right? We know that this has to come first, right? So we cannot assume that the, um, so let me put it to you this way, I'll, I'll put in a sports reference. You're never gonna say that Kobe, that Michael Jordan stole shit from Kobe, right? You'll never say that Michael Jordan stole his game from Kobe. Why would you not say that? Because Michael came first. So you cannot say that the Bible stole from Patahotep because Patao Tep came first, right? So it's, it's more likely, right? It's more um, reasonable that whoever started writing the Bible got a hold of this and ideas began to flow. That just, it's, his story kind of shows us that that's the way that things kind of work, right? And, and, and not to say that you're wrong, but it's important to be historically accurate. Right. And what happens is, especially for African people and African epistemologies or what's called knowledge productions. Right. They always get pushed to the side and then they're focused around Eurocentric ideas and Eurocentric thoughts, although the African inventions predate the European thoughts. Right. So we have to be careful of that. We get in a habit, especially us as black folks, of wanting to prioritize European information. Instead, it says here in the book, 2,500 years before Jesus walked the planet. Um, let's shift the conversation a little bit um, outside of the, the theologians in the room. Um, I want to hear for some other people before we call it a day, um, pre preferably somebody who we haven't heard of, heard from, excuse me. Um, so Emiliano, CJ, Karina, Andy, Kyle, um, Fabian, Carlos. We haven't heard from you guys today, so let me get two more comments and we'll close it out. You can volunteer or be volunteer. Hello? Yeah, I got you, Andy. Go ahead. Um, I just want to talk about the, I guess, main point about um, the reading. Okay. Uh, well, I basically said that in the title, like the teachings of Tahotep, um, I guess he was teaching his son or like whoever was willing to listen uh, how to become a better person or leader. Um, I, I thought it was really like informing. I, I think a lot more people should read these things because um, like they are important. They... A lot more people should, I guess, follow these teachings because, like, it makes you a better person. Uh, and the thing it says, if you follow these rules or teachings or whatever, uh, prosperity will follow. Um, so I think that's just very important. Uh, one of my favorite ones, or not favorite, but, like, the one that I liked or stuck with me was 19. Um, it talks about how greed is evil uh, and don't fall for it and, like, humbleness leaves a legacy. Um, I really like that one. You know, Andy, you said a lot, man. Um, and what I just can't get beyond from your statement is, you know, if everyone re read this, where would we be as a society, right? Um, and then you go into this idea of greed and, and how they had hoard this notion of greed. And we are a society that is fundamentally based on this idea of greed. We have a whole economic system, capitalism, that is underpinned, undergirded, and scaffolded by greed. Go out and get as much as possible, right? The accumulation of more opposed to people's well-being. This is the economic system that we exist in, right? It's antithetical to what's being talked about in this text. Um, so we'll close it out with what's being said in the chat, in the chat, excuse me. 
um, in the reading estates, no one was born wise. How was, ever, how was anyone ever wise enough to preach good speech? Since some religions, uh, um, some religious events are based on believing in your faith in God rather than the fact or the way it could be proved. Um, stuff like him turning water into wine and stuff like that, or him um, curing people, right? Um, yeah, well, okay, a couple of things to reverse the first part, to address the first part of Emiliano, Emiliano's statement. Um, keep in mind, there was a system in place to get you from being unwise to wise. And that was that comedic mystery schools, right? And, and for you to be able to go from freshman to sophomore, from sophomore to junior, to junior to senior, you had to master spiritual principles, right? And in, in your mastering of spiritual principles, you start to accumulate more aspects of wisdom, right? Um, and, and I think it's important for us to, again, separate this idea of how we understand religion how it works today, juxtaposed to what they're talking about here. I don't believe this to be a, a religious text, although it may sound like it because it sounds like the Bible, right? But what he's talking about is how to live your life, not how to live a religious life, but just how to be, how to be a person who lives a life based on ma'at, which we will get into next week, right? So it's not about having faith, right? So it's not having about having to believe God could turn water into wine, right? It's about you being the best individual as, as you could possibly be. I'll give you another way to understand this. Is any, does anybody, is everyone familiar with the Sphinx? Let me rephrase that. Is there anyone who is not familiar with the Sphinx? Okay, so the Sphinx is the um, architecture in Kemet or in Egypt, and it's like a big lion with a man's head on the top, right? Ooh, yeah, I know. So it's also called the Hurim Akit, right? What the speak symbolizes, right? The body is a lion. The lion is the fiercest animal in the jungle, right? The most um, biggest animal to be respected and feared is the, is the lion, right? But they put a man's head on top of the lion to symbolize you become God, you become God-like, you become caressed, or what they would call caressed. Once you're able to overcome your animal nature right once you're able to suppress that lying inside of you those natural lying um animalistic desires and move with wisdom move with forethought then you become godlike that's what the spink symbolizes right so this is really about people on earth becoming as close to god as possible by living through these principles by how they relate and interact with one another Right. Um, so we'll end it there. I just want to show you guys real quick where to go to get your readings for next week. Give me one second. Um, and I know you also want to um, see where to go to get the recorded lectures. So I'll show you that real quick as well. Um, hold on, let me go back. There was a somebody raised it or put something in chat. Uh, okay. Um, Karina, can we start next week with the, the points that you feel are controversial? Because I, I think that's very interesting. So let's Monday, we'll start off with that, okay? Um, in the classwork section, where it says course lectures at the very top, these are the recorded lectures. Um, for this class, I forgot to record, so there's nothing there. Um, but you will have a recorded lecture for this week, for sure, okay? Um, but for our readings, we're still in weeks one through three. We just finished the teaching of Patahotep. This is what we're going to read next week. So Karanga Ma'at 1, 2, and 3. Again, it's Karanga Ma'at 1, 2, and 3. Just like last week's reading, there was two separate ones. Um, but think about it as one. This week, there's three separate ones. But think about it as one. So read all three, but just make one journal entry. Um, Karina, you had your hand up? I'm sorry, is it Karina or Gisela that you had your hand up? Me, it's Gisela. But um, I was going to ask you, for the lecture from last week, is it on here too? No, nah, I, I forgot to record last week, so I, oh, didn't, okay. I didn't put it up. But what I'll do is I'll put the slides up. Yeah, okay. I'll put Thank that in this section here. Um, and then you'll have today's recording available in this section as well. Uh, Brianna? 
Um, yeah. Do we submit our journals? No, don't submit the journals until the midterm and then again on the final day of class. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Jaden? Um, for the journals this time, um, are there like specific points that you want us to have like um, per um, kind of like in this week's format or does the, which, what kind of journal format do you want? So it'll be just like, so I don't care with the format, you know, I don't, however you so choose to do the format is up to you, but as long as you have the analysis or the thesis, I'm sorry, as long as you have the thesis, your analysis, your contemporary analysis and your questions, as long as you have those four components, however you so choose to do the um, format is totally up to you. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it did. Sorry, I was writing that down. No, no worries. Um, any other questions, concerns, or comments? 